How is everyone today? Good. Good. Yes. Good. Uh, title of today's sermon is Living Out Your Faith. Turn with me, if you will, into James 1.1. 1, 1. It says this, James, a bondservant of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, again, for the opportunity to come together as your people, Father, that we come together to hear your word. I pray, Father, that, uh, that we heed your word today, that we learn from your word today, that we grow from your word today. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have to tell you, can you not look at the very beginning of this, that uh, at the humility that James opens the letter with, right? James could have opened the letter by dropping a few names. Hey, I'm James, Jesus' brother, right? But he didn't do that. He opened up by saying that he was a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't build himself up, but he declared that he was a slave of our Lord. The truth is that everyone is a slave to something. Everyone is a slave to something, whether you're a slave to sin or you're a slave to to Christ. Here is something else that, that is true, that we can accept this premise. If you can't accept the premise of verse 1, you'll never be able to accept verse 2, right? And we'll see that in a few minutes. So I'm going to make a bold statement. Putting your faith to work in your life has more to do with how you respond to trials and troubles in this life than perhaps anything else in your life. Faith isn't this kind of pie-in-the-sky stuff. Trials and difficulties in this life often reveal true faith. So is it any wonder this little book of James, James begins to, to challenge the believers in, 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 in this idea of making our faith real, that he immediately launches into the truth about trouble. Now don't miss the fact that his original audience was in trouble, right? Right? His original audience, the last part of the verse 1 is often overlooked. It is. Notice James is writing to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. Now in general that dispersion or the dysphoria refers to the Jews living outside of Palestine. The word dispersed can be translated as scattered. It's like seed being scattered uh, by the farmer's hand. In fact... The scattering of these Jewish believers was tantamount to the scattering of the seeds of the gospel. More specifically, James's audience, many uh, of these Jews had been scattered because of persecution. That's why they were scattered. Claudius, the Roman emperor, was, uh, was driving the Jews into exile. Under his rule, the Jewish were driven out of their homelands and even out of Rome. Life was threatening and unsafe for the Jews. But the Jews had but those the Jews that had begun to follow Jesus, who had begun to follow Christ, really had double trouble on their hands. Right? Being Jewish, they were hated by the Gentiles. And being Jewish and now following Christ, they were facing persecution from their own people. Man, talk about trouble, right? They had a lot of it. There was trouble on every level. Everything that had changed for them. They were literally scattered, forced to leave their homes and run for their very lives to other cities and villages. And you know how hard it is to move when you have time, right? When you've got the time to move and you can plan it, it's still tough, right? You can do all this planning, all these hours of, of thinking about it and getting it all together. But what if you heard on the nightly news... You know that everyone, every Christian who is following the Lord had an hour, one hour to get out of Marion County, right, under the penalty of death. Can you imagine how you would leave? How you just pack things up? Imagine just throwing everything together and getting out? You know, maybe that's why James gets, gets right to it. With hardly more than a saying hello James begins the discussion of the primary subject that was on their minds. And, and, and they want to know, how do you live out your life of faith? What do you do when you are surrounded by trouble? What do you do when you're surrounded, when you're going through trials and tribulations in this life? So James effectively begins the letter 
with an answer, he knew that they were asking the same question that Christians have been asking for over 2,000 years. And he answers and speaks the truth about trials. Look here in James 1-2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Count it all joy. You know, there is one word that really I want you to take note of here. There's one word that I want you to take note of here that uh, is sometimes overlooked, and that's that word uh, when, right? Circle that when in your Bibles, because the first the truth about trials is they're unavoidable. They are unavoidable. Like Brian was saying earlier, they're, they're unavoidable. James didn't say, Cons consider it all joy, my brethren, if you encounter various trials in your life. But he said when. When? At the very onset of this issue, James is telling all of us that we are to expect trouble. That trials are a given. In fact, if you don't go around looking for trouble, man, trouble will find you. You know, there are well-meaning people who believe that if you, if you really have enough faith, whatever trouble you're going through, it's just going to go away. That if you're really following Jesus, trials and persecutions will become a thing of the past and that you're going to live in this perpetual, perpetually on this mountaintop with health, wealth, and your dream job and a perfect relationship and this trouble-free life. But that's not what James is saying here. He says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. He didn't say count it all joy when you escape various trials. Certainly joy is the absence of trials, right? Isn't joy the absence of trials? If you're a slave to God and you want to obey your master, surely trials will become a thing of the past, right? Right? But Jesus said something radically different than that. He says something radically different than a lot of the televangelists today. Look what Jesus said in John 16, 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He also says in Matthew 6, 34, do not, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. The Apostle Paul also says uh, something similar here in Acts 14.22, strengthening the souls of his disciples, exhorting them to continue in faith, and saying that we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. That we must. And in other words, the Christian experience is notably, noted, notably distinct. Not in the absence of trials, but by the presence of them. James says when, not if. You see, the very, in a very real way, Christians of every nationality today are God's dispersed people. Like seeds from His hands dispersed by the sovereignty throughout the world to serve both as light and salt. Christians who understand that he or she is a slave of God, like James did, says in uh, James 1.1, 1, 1, they can have joy when surrounded by trouble because he lives for the things that matter the most. His evaluation, the way that he totals up life, his values are radically different than how he lived before. In fact, believers understand that trials have values. And James shows us that next. That trials shape us into the character of Christ. And no wonder, right? No wonder Satan wants trials to defeat us. While God will use those trials to develop us. To make us stronger. And a slave of God knows that his master is ultimately in control. I like the way someone uh, said it when he wrote, Satan may turn up the heat, but God has his hands on the thermostat. <laughs> it's that kind of trust, it's that kind of submission as slaves of God that we evaluate trouble 
with a joyful spirit instead of a complaining and a bitter, resentful spirit. I can't think of a better illustration than Joseph. The world's evaluation or the world's reckoning, he had every reason. Joseph had every reason to grow bitter and be angry and to live in constant complaining about what he went through. His brothers sold him into slavery when he was a youth. And he lost his youth. Could you imagine? He lost his youth. He was separated from his family. He grew up in this strange land. He was sold as a slave to a man who finally showed him some mercy and gave him a better job managing his household. But then his boss's wife, what did she do? She said that, uh, that he tried to rape her and then they put him in prison. He gets in the prison. He's innocent. He's in prison. He interpreted a dream of the butler who when he got the butler got out of prison, according to uh, Joseph's interpretation, then proceeded to forget about him. For years, Joseph remained in prison. But by every stretch of the imagination, Joseph, Joseph should have come out of that prison cynical and bitter toward people and angry toward God. You know, because he didn't get a fair shake. For many years, he didn't get a fair shake, did he? He was surrounded by trouble, and no one seemed to even care. Yet he emerges from the shadow of the prison with grace and a balance of faith. Why? Because he come to believe that God had orchestrated the whole thing. It was a part of his plan, which meant really part, which meant a lot of suffering for him. And I'm sure at the time that he was going through this very difficult time for Joseph, it was hard to see God's plan. How many know that when you're going through difficulties in this life, you may wonder, God, there seems to be no, no purpose in this. Why? Why? And we need to understand, and we'll get to this in a, a later sermon, that it isn't always God. It isn't God that's always putting this on people. Right? God can use the trials in our life, but it isn't God. The Bible just tells us that God doesn't tempt men with evil, nor is He tempted by it. So God's not going to put something on you just to mess with you. Right? But we're in this life. We're in a fallen world. And, and being a part of a fallen world, there are things that just happen. We're going to go through trials. But being a Christian as well... Let me tell you something. Like Brian said earlier, being a Christian, we can almost expect this persecution. We are seeing the world as it becomes more secularized. We can see this world turning on true believers. Now, the, the world wraps its arm around all these people who say that they are Christian, but are not. The ones who are bowing their knee to their, the world's doctrine and not Christ's. We have to realize that until that, you know, going back to uh, Joseph, you have to realize that until he actually seen his vision come true, he may not have recognized God's plan all along. Could you imagine him sitting in there and finally seeing his brothers bowing down? And then he knew, though it was difficult, though it was hard, though he suffered, God had a plan, and He raised him up, and He realized that. The opening statement that James delivers, the premise, he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? You know, I, don't, I, 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 I do want you to remember the, the basic premise here. That is, you do not get to choose the trials in your life. But you know something? you get to choose how you respond to them. So you can't choose the trials, but you can choose how you respond to them. Speaking from past experience as a prisoner in Nazi Germany, uh, the concentration camps, Dr. Uh, Viktor Frankl, he said this, everything can be taken from a human being but one thing. The last of human freedoms, the freedom to choose one's attitude at any given set of circumstances. That's pretty powerful. How true is that? Trials can strip everything from you except your attitude toward them. We can't choose our trials, 
but we can choose how we respond to them. James goes on in the third verse. He says, Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. The word patient is a, co a compound word that means to stay under, the ability to abide under pressure. It could be translated endurance. James says, I want you to know that when your faith is stretched and challenged, the end result of that will be endurance. The end result will be endurance. It's like lungs that have been developed through exercise. You're able to stay up underwater longer. You're able to run further and longer. Your practical faith that lives out in the public has staying power. Would you notice how James exhorts the believers in the verse? He says, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And in other words, don't circuit the work of God in your life by trying to escape the trial. Let endurance be developed. It is imperative in the Greek, it is an imperative in the Greek language. You can literally put an exclamation point after that. Phrase, let endurance have its perfect work, exclamation point. And just as, uh, and just what is this perfect result? The end of verse 4, where he says, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. And everybody immediately says, well, you know what, there's no use trying. There's no use trying. I'm so far from perfect, Right? I'm so far from perfect. All the troubles and trials in my life haven't made me an inch closer to being perfect. The word translated perfect here refers to being complete. Right? It's complete. It's having an undivided relationship with Jesus Christ. A pure relationship with Him that, is, that has undivided affections. Trials have a way of doing that, don't they? In the midst of suffering, everything that the world clamors for suddenly becomes nonsense. The Apostle Paul called it garbage. The things in this life that you once thought important are no longer important. You begin to run the race of endurance, this race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the finisher or perfecter of our faith. For who the joy was set before him endured the cross. Despising the shame, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You begin to look at Christ who endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. Because he says if they, a servant is not above his master, if they did it to him, they'll do it to you. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work. That you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. James says, in effect, trials produce the single-minded uh, uh, affection for Christ. And he goes on by the end of verse 4 where he's saying that the en endurance of the trials also produces this completeness or this maturity. By the way, James uses this word complete or mature more than any other writer in the New Testament. Maturity is, a, is big to James. And why not? Faith matters in life. Faith that makes a difference in this life. It's faith that is grown up. Not just little faith. You know where Jesus said that if you have faith as a mustard seed, He didn't say faith the size of a mustard seed as some translations have, but if you have faith as or like a mustard seed, how many know that mustard seeds start off small, but they ain't intended to stay that way, are they? They're intended to grow, to become something so large, and that's the faith that we should have. That's the faith that is whole. Trials are not electives in, this, uh, in God's school of spiritual maturity. They are required courses. Right? You must do your homework and let me tell you something, you will take the test. Amen? 
James is a realist. He knows that in order for us to accept the premise and to adopt this attitude of joy, for us to stay under pressure and allowing the testing to produce this maturity in our faith, he knows we've got a problem. At least two of them. First problem is that we may simply not understand. Right? We're going around. We need wisdom to see past the trials, to see the hand of God working in them. We're going to need the wisdom of God. Right? We need the wisdom to believe that the, per, the present trials in our life doesn't mean that God had disappeared or God has left us. And it's easy to feel that way. I'm sure Joseph, when he was sitting in prison all those years, thinking, where is God in this place? We're going to, you know, we're going to need help in this growing up. Amen? The sign of spiritual maturity is the wisdom to simply trust even when it seems absent. Look what he says in verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives with all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Ask God. If you need wisdom to evaluate the problems in your life with this joyful endurance, and every believer will, go ahead and ask God who gives all. And I love the word all here, right? God doesn't play favorites. He doesn't say, if some of you, some of you who are my top students, you know, you, I'll give you the wisdom and maybe, maybe not so much for over here, give them a little bit here, but to all. God gives all, and note this, with generosity. With generosity and without reproach. God never says, you need wisdom for that, that's easy. God never says, you, again, He gives. But you notice how James, he, 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 he does not say, if any man lacks knowledge, let him ask of God. There's a big difference between knowledge and wisdom, isn't there? There's a huge difference. Knowledge is facts. It's data. It's stuff that you learn. Wisdom is knowing how to correctly use that knowledge. Mankind has learned uh, enough knowledge to know how to travel faster than the speed of sound. Wisdom knows that mankind in general uh, traveling faster and faster uh, is going in the wrong direction. I can see how this nation is going the wrong way. That's wisdom that dictates that. Isn't it interesting that James tells us to ask God for wisdom? Why not ask God for deliverance? Why not ask God for strength? Why not ask God for grace? But he says he asked for wisdom. If any man lack of wisdom, let him ask of God. Because we need wisdom so we don't waste the opportunity that God has given us to grow up in our faith, to move towards spiritual maturity. In his commentary on James Warren Wearsby, told of his secretary in his church who was going through severe trials. Her husband had lost his sight and he was recently suffered a minor stroke. Her husband grew ill and they rushed him to the hospital and everyone expected him to pass away. And, 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 and Wearsby writes, he says, I saw her in church one Sunday and assured to her that I was praying for her. She said, what exactly are you praying for? Her question startled the pastor, right? Who responded, well, I'm asking God to help you and strengthen you. And she said, she said you know what, I appreciate that. But I want you to pray one more thing. Pray that I will have the wisdom not to waste all this suffering. He wrote, she knew the meaning of James 1.5. She knew the meaning of it. Asking God for wisdom so that the suffering would produce endurance and not be wasted. Now James, he moves on after verse 5. He moves into... Uh, a warning in verse 6. Look what he says. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. 
the average Christian again says, well, you know what? That rolls me out. I need wisdom, but I doubt God's going to give it to me. Poor, woe is me. To the casual reader, it can be an unfortunate misinterpretation. However, James is actually describing a wicked man. The same way Isaiah described one being like a troubled sea. The word double-minded literally translated two-souled. A man that has two souls, right? Or two hearts or two directions. James is referring to someone who is constantly changing allegiances. You see, this is a deeper problem than doubting whether God will grant his requests. It actually refers to a person's unwillingness to live in the will of God. One author calls him a, a walking silver war in which trust and distrust for God wages a continual battle against each other. So you need to understand that James isn't referring to someone who has some honest doubts or even per, perhaps misdirected sense of, of, of humility, but assumes God probably has more important things to do than to answer his or her prayer. James is describing a person who says he wants God's direction in his life, but in reality, he's keeping all of his options open. I remember one time, and, and, and this was many, many years ago, I was going through a trial, and then... You know, you think, I, 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 you know, how the, the thoughts of, of, of turning away and going a different direction, you would have that, that temptation to turn back to the world. And, and I, I thought to myself, I'm like, there's nowhere else to go. I have nowhere else to turn. There is no other option for me because I had, I had devoted my life to serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And no matter what comes my way, there's no other option. Now, that's, that, that's different here. Here's a person who may be, oh, I'll serve Jesus as long as everything's going well, but let me tell you something, I'm keeping my options open. James is saying, in fact, no one will receive wisdom from God until their only option is to be obedient to the submission of God. Until then, James writes in verse 8, this man is unstable in all of his ways. That word for unstable comes from the word that means unsettled or disorderly, fickle. One who's, who's not able to settle down. It carries the idea of never committing in life. He, 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 he inclines toward God one day and toward the world the next. James uses this same word to describe confusion and disorder in 1 Corinthians 14.33 where he says, God is not the author of confusion but of peace, as in all the church and the, of the saints. So he says, so ask in faith, which means you've made up your mind that you want the wisdom of God so you can ultimately obey the will of God. Now several Bible scholars believe that the book of James is actually a sermon that was delivered by someone uh, that, and someone transcribed it. One indication that James inserts this illustration in the middle of the discussion of trials and endurance, notice here in verse 9, where it says, Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich man in his humiliation. Because as a flower of the field will pass away, for no sooner as the sun had risen from the burning heat, than it withers the grass, its flowers fail, and its beauty appearances perishes, so the rich man will fade away in his pursuits. The point of this illustration is perspective. It's perspective, right? The poor believer and the rich believer both realize that they're on ground level when it comes to, when it comes to trials. Trials don't care how rich you are. Death doesn't care how rich you are or how much money you got in the bank or lack thereof. Depending on the statistics that you looked at, I looked this up this morning and I was studying that, this is, that, that uh, suicide rates are higher in higher income levels. And some, some, some say, well, they're higher in lower income uh, levels. But the fact of the matter is, is that there's so many other factors involved, so it's hard to just go on income alone. But let me tell you something, a lot of rich people kill themselves. 
Right? If money solves your problem, there'd be nobody killing themselves being rich. White men are four times more likely to commit suicide than women and twice as likely than any other racial group, except for the American Indians. Women are more likely to attempt suicide, but just like in sports, they just ain't as good at it as men. <laughs> it's the truth, right? Whether you're rich or poor, let me tell you something, trials do not discriminate. Both in giving a new status in Christ, and it is Christ that they are to trust. Amen. A poor man uh, needs to consider his high position as the prince in which God has given him in this life, that he is a member of a holy family. The rich believer needs to remember that he can't trust in his wealth. Because it can wither just as quickly as a flower fading away. Right? It goes on in verse 4. Here's the promise, people. Here's the promise. Blessed is a man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord promised to those who love him. Verse 12, is conclude, he concludes the statement of his discussion on trial. It's kind of a form of the, uh, of the Beatitudes. James is sounding more like his half-brother, Jesus Christ here. Blessed is a man, literally happy or satisfied, is a man who perseveres. It isn't a wish, by the way. It isn't that you hope to be blessed. I hope you will be satisfied. The, the verse is a verdict. You are blessed, both now and later, as James writes, when you receive the crown of life. The temptation ultimately is uh, to get you to turn away from sin. That's what the temptation it, it tries to do. It, get, it tries to get you to turn away from the Lord. That's why trials in our lives, it tries to get you to get off course. Whether it's a trial in your life or some enticement to a particular sin, it tries to carry you from the Lord. Lord. James isn't implying that you can earn eternal life by enduring suffering, but what he is saying is that a believer can earn a crown, a unique reward for having suffered with joy. Like I said before, you don't get to choose your crosses, but you can choose how you respond to them. One day we'll be rewarded you know, and, and, and like I said, we'll be rewarded because how we chose to respond in faith and in wisdom and in prayer and in joy. John Phillips, who went to be with the Lord, recorded in his commentary a story about this uh, 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 by Howard Hendricks uh, at the Moody Bible Institute's annual Founders Week conference. He says, let me read to you, let me read to you, well, let me read to you this. He says, he says once he had an opportunity to play the town champion in checkers. So he's going to go play the town champion in checkers. And this fellow was so confident that he was going to just take this old veteran. He was just going to beat him, right? That he was given the chance to move first and decided to set the pace. And after a few moves, the opponent put a piece of line in fire and he jumped him. Hendricks did also, and then he ended up, he ended up running the board on him, right? He jumped, 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 and his checkers, he hopped down the board and scooping up all these checkers from him, and he gets to the end, he says, crown me. <laughs> and after that, Hendricks didn't have a chance as piece by piece he was pounced on, and he ended up losing. No good checker player minds losing occasional piece here and there. Right? And he can do it with joy. You know why? Because he knows where he's headed to. And he's headed for the crown. Right? Like I said, you can't choose your crosses, but you can choose how you respond to it. You know, there's a better way really to encourage us all here. James effectively says, one day your crosses will be exchanged for a crown will be exchanged for a crown. So what do we do? We're going to play on in this game of life. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep pressing forward. Right? 
We're going to go through trials. won't be easy. But you know something? It will be rewarding in the end. Amen. Amen. Let, let's pray. Father, again, I thank you for your word today. I ask, Father, that you would strengthen us. Give us wisdom, I pray. Father, that we would have the wisdom, even in the midst when we don't understand, that you would, you would grant us wisdom and strength, Father. Help us to have the grace to continue on. And Father, I pray that it draws us closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.